the next to the last uh, colloquium on uh, which will be Monday by another one of our colleagues. Um, today we have with us Clovia, Dr. Clovia Hamilton, who's from the Kelly School in Business Law and Ethics with us. She's going to be speaking on cybersecurity, but I have a couple of quick announcements here. So next Monday will be, next Monday at noon as usual, will be the last colloquium of the year. So welcome back. Happy Thanksgiving. I hope everyone had a happy uh, break. But I also want to announce on 1214, I, I'm, I'm want to get the name right, Jingle Mingle Holiday Party. That'll be here in the workshop. So please come on over for that. You should have gotten an email about it because uh, they're trying to keep some numbers on it. So please RSVP, but come on over for that. Um, but anyway, I'm going to turn it over to Clovia Hamilton because I happen to know she has the first slide about who I am. <laughs> but hopefully everyone has been able to access uh, the paper for today. Uh, 30 second heads up, that's going to that's gonna go private again. Uh, probably later today. So, because uh, it's obviously a pre-publication. So, over to you. Hey, welcome, Claudia. <laughs> I mean, you can be pumped up. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, long semester. <laughs> um, as far as my background goes, I'm a multidiscipline. Um, you can read about me on my website. Um, but I'm multidiscipline in engineering. Um, business and law. Um, I've worked and taught um, industrial operations management, supply chains, um, smart cities. I study privacy. Um, I'm getting in more into cybersecurity and you hear a little bit about security issues with the cryptocurrency today. And um, I've taught ethics, business ethics and engineering ethics for a very long time, for about 13 years. So I am tenure track, so I want to get this uh, or something similar to this published pretty soon. Um, so I'll tell you about my study. Um, I'll tell you what motivated this study, my interest in cryptocurrency, because I'm not a finance person or IT person. So I'm a grandma. <laughs> I, don't, I don't buy stock. I'm not like Scott and Angie and all this. And, Yes, I'm truly an outsider looking in. Oh, Matt Damon. <laughs> the true uh, lay person looking at cryptocurrency. I was I was curious about it because um, it's been in the news quite a bit. So I just you know I like to do research when I'm trying to understand something. So I'll, I'll tell you about my research method on this study. The research questions that I chose. Um, the status of the paper right now and um, uh, the current recommendations that I've pulled from the data that I, that I uh, collected, and then the next steps, what I want to do going forward and how I'm going to pick your brains at the very end of the talk to get feedback from you guys. Um, you know, so your thoughts at the very end. Um, I have about 30 slides and I'll, you know, I should be able to kind of plow through them in about 15, 20 minutes. Um, I taught in South Korea, uh, Korea last um, uh, for Stony Brook University's um, campus in South Korea, a, a little suburb of Seoul called Sangdo. And um, when you're in a foreign country, I was there for two or three years, we watch the news. Uh, Americans, we watch the news because we don't know the language. <laughs> so, so it's the only thing. Uh, that is uh, in English is a, a lot of news. So, you know, there's a lot of news about cryptocurrency and that's what sparked my interest. It's such a hot, hot topic. We hear about cryptocurrency daily. Um, and so I, I set forth to just try to make sense of what I was hearing in the news. Um, so I'm an outsider looking in, as I mentioned, um, I don't have the, the finance or I do have an IT background. I started in artificial intelligence when I first got started, um, but I've been away from it. Um, the title of the paper, Money is Morphing, comes from John Unger Land. Um, he was the operating officer of Dayland Fintech Consulting. And um, that's been bought up by a, um, a credit union. Um, but a couple of years ago, three years ago, he was quoted as saying that money is morphing. Each month, the global economy sees 
more users, total capital transactions outside of traditional banking. And you know, we we all know that this is occurring. Um, but there are you know critics and there are proponents for for this morphing of money. Uh, I want to get started with uh, just a few definitions that appear in the paper. Um, if you have an IT background, of course, you probably already know this, but I, I put this in here because we might have folks um, joining us who don't have this uh, understanding of cryptocurrency. So these nice little cute little blocks I have here, um, I captured this from a YouTube video, uh, could represent the trans, uh, you know, monetary transaction between peers, between a couple of people. Uh, so the blockchain is technology that uses uh, distributed uh, decentralized ledger. It records digital cash transactions on this peer-to-peer. -peer. So we literally have peers, Phil, Ted, Sam, Jack, um, and the blocks represent the uh, cash trans, digital cash or digital currency transactions between them. Um, if we collectively pick up the blocks. Um, we call that the ledger. Um, so you'll see that language in the paper. Um, the distributed ledger is when the uh, chain of ledgers are shared among the peers um, in a public way, we would say that that's a public distributed ledger. Um, and then here is just another depiction of how the blockchains are distributed among the, the, you know, the peers from peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, another term that's in the paper is the consensus system for de decentralization. Uh, so decentralization is just, it's used to get agreement on the validity of the transactions in this ledger. So uh, if someone is buying or selling, uh, but between peers, uh, we can get agreement on the validity of those transactions in a decentralized way, uh, or we're using this algorithm called the consensus system. And there are various types of consensus systems um, that I had to learn about. Uh, grandma had to learn uh, proof, of, proof of work, uh, proof of state, proof of authority, proof of commitment. Um, proof of work is being used by Bitcoin. Uh, they, their proof of work algorithm is called Hashcash. Ethereum uh, can, can use the proof of work, but they came out with proof of state. Um, my interest in all of this is um, the energy consumption. So I talk about that, um, uh, especially when we get to what I called out of the data that I collected. But proof of work, uh, is known for um, having a lot of waste in energy consumption and, and uh, running these algorithms. Uh, proof of state conserves server energy. And so uh, Ethereum's ETH is uh, considered to be a, a better algorithm. And then we've got a couple other systems that I learned about uh, in the data that I collected in Lewis. Uh, uh, by Lambda's 256 exchange for cryptocurrency. They use proof of authority. And then Signum is another uh, system that's a proof of commitment system. So we got all these different types of systems. And what I've found in the literature is just the differences in the amount of energy that's being used. So that um, improvements in this technology is, is kind of highlighted. Um, what is a coin? It's just the, the virtual currency. Um, and Ethereum doesn't call their system a coin. Uh, they call they use smart contracts or uh, instead of using the term coin, they, they actually use accounts. So they're a little bit different. Um, crypto mining, we have what's called rigs. And this is where all that energy consumption is uh, problematic. Um, so crypto mining refers to the process of verifying and uh, validating those blockchain 
transactions. Um, and mining is the process in which the cryptocurrency transactions between the users get verified and added to that ledger, to the public distributed ledger. Um, the work done by these crypto miners is very intensive in terms of computational resources. And that's where we get a lot of criticism for the use of cryptocurrency. Um, it's called crypto because of the cryptographic techniques that are used to secure these transactions between users. And um, so in my study, I wanted to make sense of all of this, <laughs> all of the news in particular. And so I used a bibliometric method. Um, it's my research method of choice. I, I tend to turn to systematic literature reviews. I use the Cochrane method. Um, it's used primarily in healthcare research. And I, I do meta-analyses and bibliometrics. This, this one is a bibliometric, but I'm calling it a bibliometric critical appraisal because a critical appraisal is a type of literature review. There's probably 12, 15 different types of literature review. Um, but I'll, I'll share with you uh, what's involved with the critical appraisal. Um, and again, the advantages is to just kind of make sense of all of this identify some trends and what uh, is being said, not only in peer-reviewed literature, but also in what we call gray literature, the news and press releases and things like that. Um, and what I like about this research method is that it's objective. So we can all discuss after uh, the session what you think about crypto, whether you're a critic or a proponent. And I would say, yeah, but what's in the data? <laughs> you know, well, let's look at it from an objective standpoint. So that's what's so important about um, picking a research method. Um, so with critically appraising crypto, uh, we call it a CAT. It's a type of literature review that summarizes the research e evidence, but we organize all the evidence that we choose um, around certain research questions. Um, and the goal is to critique the research, um, provide a statement of relevance for the result. And um, again, this method is used in healthcare as well. Uh, there are five steps. We ask the focus uh, question. We search for the evidence, uh, critically appraise that evidence for whether it's valid and relevant to our practice, so in, in this study, the practice area is cryptocurrency and mining, um, and then applying the results to professional practice. How, what can we do with the results that we get in terms of improving cryptocurrency? Um, and then we uh, later, we can come back with a, a, another paper and evaluate whether our recommendations were actually implemented. So that's the evaluation of performance. Um, so with respect to cryptocurrency, I wanted to look at um, how can this mining or manufacturing be conducted in an environmentally sustainable manner? Um, can cryptocurrency replace traditional banking in a way that is uh, sustainable? And um, with the Cochrane method, for the literature review, um, when you look at uh, population uh, interventions, comparisons and outcomes, and um, it was designed again for healthcare, uh, a population of people, uh, some kind of medical intervention, uh, comparing uh, different in interventions, different things that you can do to make the improvements and then your outcomes. So what I did in applying it to Cryptocurrencies, I'm saying, well, the populations are engaged in uh, investing in cryptocurrency or mining and using cryptocurrency. Our interventions are things like what are the environmentally sustainable strategies for mining? Um, our comparison of analyses of traditional banking and uh, the non-traditional currency models like the cryptocurrency would be the comparison. 
And then the outcomes is the strengths and the challenges related to sustainability. Um, you start with a Boolean search of databases where you think you can find uh, journal articles related to your research question. So this is a very broad search that I've started out with and it, it worked uh, for the most part. Um, I use these data sets, uh, academic search complete, business source complete. I looked at business journals. I also looked at computer journals, information science, energy and power, entrepreneurship, and, um, and in the news, uh, large news databases, because I wanted to make sure I, I, I got that kind of gray literature thrown in there. Um, I searched uh, originally looking 10 years back. Look, so I went back to 2010 last year. And um, so my paper needs to be updated because I need to bring it forward. Um, but I, you know, I just want to walk you through, you know, how how it goes. Uh, I found 111 pubs and 22 were peer reviewed. Most were news references. And then what you do is what's called a prism system of reporting. You have to track everything that you come across and decide whether it's relevant whether it's a duplication. If you eliminate anything, you have to keep up with all your references. The, the name of the game in systematic literature reviews is that somebody should be able to follow you, use that same Boolean search in same databases and get the same results. So you have to really track, you know, uh, uh, your selection of publications, why you selected, why you got rid of, a, a publication for relevance say, and, th and things like that. Um, so uh, we keep, uh, you know, I kept track of the re references um, that I identified, the 111, um, the amount that I uh, removed, and, and I went with 81 publications. So then it's, uh, the, the name of the game is to read all 81 publications and summarize that and try to make sense of it. Um, and again, um, in the paper, I make reference to we this and we that because I, I tend to draft these and then I look for collaborators, for co-authors. Um, and so I, I, I tend to write in terms of we. Um, the paper outline is very simple uh, because as I was reading these publications, the publications basically split between critics versus proponents, you know? So the, the outline is very simple. What are the critics saying? What are the proponents saying? The critics are saying that, you know, this is just a game. Using cryptocurrency is just a game uh, that investors are engaged in for fun. <laughs> and it's not gonna last. And we kind of see that volatility news is, you know, up and down. Uh, they're concerned about it not being properly regulated. and um, uh, the players, the actors that, that are engaged in cryptocurrency with buying and selling are hidden. That's the way the algorithm works. And so that scares people, you know, because in traditional banking, we know who we're dealing with. Uh, so the, the hidden identities is a concern. Um, it's right for cyber crime. We've got fraud, scamming, uh, ransomware issues, you know, people wanting to uh, you to pay ransom with cryptocurrency. So that's scaring folks. And, you know, uh, there's a lot of criticism about using it. Um, and it's uh, difficult to get mass adoption. You have much more adoption of the use of our credit cards and our traditional banking than we do with cryptocurrency. So when will we ever get there where cryptocurrency uh, can be mass, ad mass ad adoption is an issue. Um, the proponents uh, in the literature, what they really love about it is that it's a, it can level the playing field for third world country, developing countries that don't have banks. I mean, a lot of us, in developed countries may not realize that folks are still stuffing their pillows with cash and you know their mattresses with cash and hiding money um, because they 
uh, don't have secure banks like we do. Um, so it's good for citizens that we call it unbanking. Um, and uh, so it's good for citizens that do not have bank accounts. It's a, I teach diversity, ethic, uh, equity, and inclusion in ethics. And so it's a diversity and inclusion issue. You know, how about we include other people in the same services that we uh, are afforded? Um, the other the thing about the proponents is they actually like that it's anonymous. They don't really think people need to see uh, who you are in order for you to make a purchase and, or, or to sell something. Um, and a lot of, even though we say that the identities are um, hidden, law enforcement has caught a lot of the cyber criminals. So how can they catch them if, if they're hidden? So it's not totally 100% uh, foolproof in terms of their identities being hidden because uh, criminals are being caught. That's a whole nother issue. Um, if we revisit the research questions about environmental sustainability, um, I uh, called out 10 recommendations from the 81 publications that I reviewed. Um, the first one is that it's a recommendation that these companies that are engaged in cryptocurrency that they sign on with a crypto climate accord. That they, uh, if they, if they're gonna mine cryptocurrency using those large rigs, um, uh, that they engage in uh, some kind of alternative energy sources. Um, and that's that's the second one. Use renewable energy. And there are examples that I found in the literature where companies are doing this. They're using wind tur uh, turbines, solar panels hydroelectricity and that kind of thing. What's, what's really interesting to me was um, there was a lot of, uh, there was a couple of publications focused on China. On the one hand, the Chinese government is banning the use of cryptocurrency. Um, they're, they're saying, well, we don't want that to be a, uh, a form of currency that our people can legally engage in. But on the other hand, like 60% of the mining takes place in China. <laughs> so, um, but what, they come, what they've come out and said is, well, yeah, we do this and it is crashing our power grid and whatnot. And we are concerned, but we're moving in this direction of renewable energy use. Um, also using carbon offsets would be a recommendation. Um, there are articles focused on the noise uh, pollution involved in uh, uh, these data centers uh, uh, where these uh, rigs are located, they, they uh, put off a lot of noise. So noise pollution is something that needs to be addressed. Um, the data centers that, you know, at the end of the day need to be more green. And then we have the issue of greenwashing. You have companies that are coming out advertising, yeah, we're green because that's the direction we need to be in. Um, but they're not so green. So, so that needs to be regulated somehow. Um, eliminating these uh, scammers, the frauds, the fakes uh, with regulation, uh, uh, improved regulation would be helpful. Um, using crypto as a, as in, in promoting it as a way to cure unbankedness in these underdeveloped countries, I would love to see more of that. And, and that's, kind of promoted in their publications. Um, use crypto to find sustainable, uh, environmentally sustainably focused small businesses and then using crypto to help um, unemployed people launch crypto because that's happening in Africa and other un undeveloped countries. They see cryptocurrency as a way out of poverty, out of, out of being unemployed. Um, and they're, they're moving in that direction. So to see more of that would be cool. And then managers and leaders of the cryptocurrency platforms need to create some sense of, of both a self-managed and collective managed community. Because it seems to be, that's not, there are unclear and gray lines there. Um, and so um, a bit of the next steps, I last ran my search, uh, like I said, last year. So I've got to 
bring it forward. Of course, like we've seen it quite a bit in the news over the past year. So I kind of keep that in mind. So when I look at my um, publications that are pulled with the new search, just to make sure I'm pulling from the right databases, I should be hearing or seeing the uh, FTX story, you know, and that kind of thing. So I try not to let uh, current news uh, bias me in, in what I uh, summarize, but I, I, I do use it to make sure that I'm, I'm hitting the right databases. So I've got to update my findings. And for uh, my target, I originally was going to try to publish this in the Sustainability Environmental Sustainability Journal, but my target now is a law journal. And what there are some proposed regulations that have come out, legal regulations, and I want to compare the recommendations that I call from the data to the proposed regulations. And if the proposed regulations aren't comprehensive enough, uh, aren't covering these 10 recommendations or additional recommendations, then that's what I would uh, promote. Um, and recommend in a law journal article is that uh, any proposed regulations that we go forward with um, be more comprehensive. Um, so for our discussion, for your thoughts, I would love to hear your thoughts about any databases that come to mind, uh, journals that come to mind that may have articles about cryptocurrency and, and sustainability issues. Um, well, the unbanking issues on the finance side, uh, regulations, and you know, and just in general, am I missing anything in all of this? So that that was grandma. <laughs> Good. Not so bad for grandma. <laughs> okay, so uh, questions. Let's start with in the room. Anyone in the room? Go for it. Yeah, so um, so as uh, so I'm, I come from the law school and um, I'm going to be a doctoral student. So the methodology that you use is very interesting to me in particular because you are coming with a uh, recommendation and you develop this methodology that you know systematically review the literature the literature. So the question is, um, but how do you connect that literature review with your recommendations? Mm -hmm. And then the fact that you have to design a law that implements some of your recommendations. How are these going to be achieved by uh, your methodology? Well, I don't start with a recommendation. <laughs> like, you know, please don't tell people that. <laughs> I, I would lose my PhD over that. <laughs> They'll revoke it. Um, I, I start with a, a research question. Um, and you really, you know, you start with a phenomenon. So the phenomenon for me was, um, all of these news stories about cryptocurrency. You know, why? Why, why is there, um, you know, so much volatility? Why is there so much angst? Uh, uh, people have very strong feelings about uh, being a promoter of it versus, or, or being a critic of it. And so I started with the phenomenon. Um, the, the literature review using uh, the systematic review makes it objective. Because I can't say, well, I like Bloomberg, and I'm just going to go with Bloomberg, CNN, Washington Post, uh, in this journal and that journal, because I like it. You pull everything that, that uh, uh, fits the Boolean search. So then it becomes objective. And you can't just sweep it under the rug, whether you like it or not. Um, the recommendations come from, uh, you know, what is the... What is the sense that is being made of, of uh, the, you know, what are the answers to the research questions? So you do have to start with a research, with, you know, at least one research question and look for the answers to the, those questions. And so my recommendations are answers to those questions that I pull from all of those 81 publications. And you'll, you know, and I'm, uh, um, I, you know, it's not a matter of saying, well, I've got 81 pubs, I should have 81 recommendations because you have overlap. You know, some of some of the authors are just saying the same things, having the same message. And out of out of that is where the 10, 10 recommendations come from. Yes. Yeah. You want to you can go next to it. Either way is fine. I, I can go after you. It's all good. So um it's more my question is more about the 
um, how you handle uh, quantity versus quality of evidence, no? Because yeah. I can have on one side, I know, 1,000 papers uh, finding a correlation, and then maybe other, just only one paper uh, properly, you know, identify the causal effect. And I will believe that paper over those 1,000. Right. So essentially, my, my point is that it's, um, again, maybe because I, I'm not aware of the method, but you can unpack a little bit there yeah. and, and talk more. Uh, that would be uh, super interesting. It's, it's, a, it's like a great question because there are some journals that will not accept this method for that reason. They will only accept, well, they'll look at your list of references um, in a list of publications that you include in your lit review, if they're not all peer reviewed and scholarly, they won't accept it. But uh, in the health profession, with the critically appraised topic method and with the Cochrane method for systematic literature reviews, they want the medical profession wants to know what uh, the everyday person is saying and what journalists are saying generally. What's in the news? What's trending? Uh, what is of concern for the general population? And I'm, I'm taking a stance that, okay, that's important for the health professions. Uh, it should be important for really, in my opinion, all professions. I think we all need to um, be looking at um, what others are saying outside of just the scholars. Because the peer review uh, journal articles are just us. It's just professors and grad students and scholars. Uh, whereas with the news pieces, you you got um, folks who are vetted too. They they you know they have their own uh, criteria for uh, they can't publish just anything. You know at least they shouldn't. Um, so um, you know so it's a matter for me. It's a now a matter of finding journals that accept uh, what we call the gray literature. Um, this the literature that is not just uh, peer review. So what you are probably referring to as quality over a quantity. Um, but I, you know, I guess I'm making a point, and um, those of us that use this method um, take the stance that there's quality and and value in in this other literature. Can I? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so my um. So criticizing the method, I was trying to, to understand it, and if, okay. see if there is room within the method to say, okay, um, I put like a weight to different statements depending on uh, the scientific quality mm -hmm. statement, and then um, I don't really care much if it's in a journal or it is in the media, so I think that there are a lot of uh, publications in journals that essentially are, are crappy and they're all, all very <laughs> nice statements on, 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 on the effects of things on other things. You know, sometimes in a media, um, op, you know, opinion, you know? so it's, um, again, is there room for that or, or it's too ambitious uh, putting those quality weight on, in, within this method? You know, I haven't seen it as a research method. But um, um, I, I can definitely dig where you're coming from. Um, and I, I think that that's something that, that probably should be explored. But I think um, uh, proponents of the research method would probably push back because then you're diminishing, if, if you did that, uh, who are you to say that, that the peer review um, scientific journals is better or should be weighed more? Than, than the others. So, I mean, it's just tough, you know? I mean, you have to draw the line somewhere. You can you can make your stance that, you, you know, this is what you choose to do, but you got to back it up with why. And then, and then you get into this whole value proposition argument debate over, you know, should we value, why should we value um, these other literature pieces? Uh, yeah, but it's, you know, great points and trust me, it gets debated all the time. And that's why certain journals will not accept but only peer reviewed uh, articles. So, yeah. Jess? Oh, did I skip Scott? Yeah, so, I, I, I can just do a quick one. That's all. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
So it's, it's less about the methods, though I do think Gustavo has a good point that it might be worthwhile putting in like in your methodology section, like clearly articulating, you know, why you're choosing this okay. you know, particular approach. Um, and some of the, and it, it kind of gets into the bigger debates we're having now about the value of experts, you know, in commentary, right? Experts yeah. versus, you know, basically the um, wisdom of the of the crowds. Um, so I'm not sure how deep you want to go into that, but I feel like that could be it one way to frame it. And this is a way to kind of get at that. Mm -hmm. um, but on this particular, I'm just thinking of the two well, that's going to be reviewing your piece and deciding whether it should be published in a law review, because this is the weird way that law journals make publication decisions. Grad students as two L's get to decide a lot of this stuff and three L's. And I'm just thinking like, what's in the news right now, right? So if you really want to make this topical, yeah. FTX, yeah. clearly. Um, and if you really want to have that be a useful kind of case study, because you already have the bulk done. So if you can wrap FTX around it, it's, it's late breaking, it's getting a lot of attention. It could be a way to have this be you know, the piece that really digs into that, but that's going to make it a lot more legal, like you said, and it's going to, in terms of reform efforts, it's going to really guide that policy analysis piece, right? Because there's been a lot of proposals that are already being floated on the Hill about what should be done about, you know, FTX to rein in some of these abuses. So you'd have to really get into those and figure out which, which works and which doesn't. And that's really different from the environmental impacts of crypto, right. which is a whole separate thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that, and you could get into that a little bit if you want to get into the the proof of stake versus proof of work. And is proof of stake really an environmental panacea here? Because it's going to decrease emissions by 99.9% .9 or whatever, like Ethereum's already rolling out. But even if so, big governance challenges, because now you're just having like the big epicenters getting to decide how the whole blockchain is governed, right? So that's where you could bring in some of the Ostrom work um, if you're interested in the complexity stuff there. So there's a lot of ways you could take it. You know what I mean? Um, Wait, and I think it could be a whole series of papers, but I think for this, in my mind, at least FTX is really hot. Proof of stake is really hot. I choose one, you know, and just have it be that. And then you could do some follow up work. But that's just me. <laughs> my question for you is. Would you present more than one research question? Uh, is that possible? The environmental sustainability as a question and then FTX and the abuse as a question. I think you're, so you're proposing like kind of a big survey piece and you, I, I think you could do that in the intro, like have a, like do the lay of the land. There's all these outstanding questions, but I really think you should focus on one okay. or two um, to really dig in and give it some depth. And if FTX is the case study that really guides the rest of the narrative, right. you, there's a lot of, as Angie knows, a lot of securities and other things that are wrapped up in, into that. Um, that's just me. I, I, I attempted a blockchain kind of primer survey piece back in 2017 when it was first with a computer scientist who since left IU for Apple. So it's called Block by Block. Um, it was Yale Law and Technology published it. So I'll, I'll send it to you. And it gives a little bit of a tech primer. It focused more on certificate authorities and stuff like that. But, you know, I think there's value to that. But I, even in that, we use a case study. Like, we, how is it being applied in this context of certificate authorities? Okay, very good. Yes. Yeah. Also related to the news, I guess that you can talk about the merge that happened in September. Um, and there's a lot of critics to proof of stake saying, actually, we can see evidence that it hasn't reduced emissions that much after we finally step mm -hmm. after it. So mm -hmm. you know, something if you can provide evidence to saying, hey, maybe it's not as good as people wanted us to believe that that mm -hmm. would be like something yeah. outstanding. That's right. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you. Panaceas, right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, just. Oh. Um, so mine is more just like um, I don't know very much about this at all. Mm -hmm. It's just really far away. So I'm learning a whole lot. And this was the especially like you giving us the terminology. <laughs> I would like to know more about how crypto is perceived to be more potentially inclusive. So I get in principle the idea, right? Makes sense. But is it like, I don't know enough about what is required to participate in cryptocurrency to understand how you could have a subset of people that don't have access to online banking. I understand in-country infrastructure might be limited, right? But like, do have access, right? So then it's really about a particular shortcoming of the banking infrastructure that is very specific. But I'm just curious if you could talk more about exactly how... Um, is more inclusive. Yeah, how it really yeah. it really gets, especially because I think our perceptions of banking infrastructure across developing countries is wonderful. <laughs> no, no, it's actually the opposite. Yeah. It's like we think it's much worse than it is. Yeah. It might be volatile, but ours are 
Well, the whole point of crypto is to rectify and improve um, problems in traditional banking. Um, I can give you an example. I uh, was at a, a restaurant a, a few days ago, um, downtown, uh, uh, I think that's our downtown, maybe Midtown, <laughs> Uptown Cafe. Is that downtown or Midtown? We call it downtown, right? Downtown. <laughs> that's true, we have a bit. <laughs> So I didn't have the parking oh, yeah. app. I get the parking app. I have to tie it to a credit card and the bank and all this. And it didn't work. And um, so cryptocurrency is, is known for being a lot easier than that and quicker and faster and more foolproof. And you don't have all those glitches where the bank is kind of hanging up your transactions. Um, so that's one reason why um, users like it and uh the ease of use is uh is 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 uh what's being recommended it's one of the recommendations for uh making it more inclusive that uh, uh that if, if, if you know if, if people don't have banking at all then they don't have to really worry about um banking glitches but the folks like us who bank we don't have to worry about banking glitches if, if we're using cryptocurrency and don't have to have those problems. So um, the inclusivity comes where large uh, governments like El Salvador and Mexico uh, takes a stance and says we don't have proper banking for our, our you know, citizens. Um, we're going to make it legal and we're going to uh, make it where you can go to McDonald's and use crypto. You can go to a store and buy your groceries with crypto. You can, you know, you don't have to worry about cash. You don't have to worry about hiding your cash because of criminals. And so that makes it more inclusive. People can use a currency and not have to worry about, just like we use our credit card or our bank card and not have to worry about the cash or the coins, you know. I think it's interesting though, the example you provided is here, right? <laughs> so it's right. not it's not actually a country. So so I just got finished talking to my brother who lives in Uganda. Because I'm here. <laughs> he lives in Uganda. He's like, actually online banking is much better in Uganda than it's in the US, mm -hmm. right? And so I guess my question is, and, I, and this may not be that major of a component of your paper. And mm -hmm. so maybe it's not worth it, but I would be super interested to really sort of like, follow this pathway of exactly for whom is it more inclusive and under what conditions? Because you just said it's a lot easier for those of us in the U.S. who have banks and credit cards, who's not like, right, who are already included in the system, right, as a result. And so I would, I think that could be probably a different paper. So maybe that's a little bit, you know, besides the point, but I, I, I think it's an interesting conversation to have to think about what, what are the relevant ways in which the barrier is actually lowered for who. Yeah, in the, in the developed country, undeveloped countries that don't have banking is a form of banking. It's a form of, of, of having digital transactions. Here is a, it's a way for us to avoid the glitches that we, that we find in traditional banking. So that's the difference between undeveloped and developed. So, yeah, you had a, had a question, Ryan? Good, thank you. Interesting stuff. Um, as in terms of understanding the methodology, uh, this kind of follows on from some of what Scott was talking about. How does this work if something interesting happens that maybe answers questions, but I'm not clear? Do those have to be questions that were in your original study? And so, for this, the example of Ethereum successfully making a re reform, getting an agreement from stakeholders and institutional change is quite interesting. So if you could explain how that does or doesn't fit with what you'd be doing if you're updating your your, your review. Thank you. For, for the uh, research method to be sound, if something came out new like that, a news piece, I would have to rerun the search. Um, and the, the thinking is that uh, if it's in the news, which it, it is, because we we see it on the news, it should come. It should the the publications, the news articles, uh, the news pieces should um, uh, appear in a new search. So that's that's basically to keep it objective. You have to run a new search. 
Um, I can make mention of a news article if I'm, I'm if I'm uh, one step away from submitting my article uh, and don't want to run a whole new search. I can make mention of something that's new in my intro, but it's not going to be a part of uh, my final recommendations. I have to run an entire new uh, uh, search and make it a part of the systematic literature review. So. Thank you. But it's, you know, it, sh it should appear, um, you know, in, in our reputable databases. So the FTX stories, the Ethereum, you know, uh, improvements and things like that should appear when, when I'm running. And if it doesn't, um, that's a red flag for me that I'm not um, capturing the right databases or, you know, looking in the right place. Staying online, Alfonso? Hello, <laughs> uh, this is Al Manns. I'm, I find this discussion very interesting and the questions that we're being asked in the discussion also very interesting in terms of methodology and where the range of prospects of your research is going. Uh, I missed your definition of cryptocurrency because I, I was distracted. I'm, calling you from my office here in Bloomington, but I had a phone call and I got distracted. But the thing I am concerned about is the question of regulations and regulations from multiple countries uh, in terms of this whole system. I understand that this is supposed to be a private governing system, but when you talk about regulations, you're talking about a public governing system. So the regulations will be Will the regulations be imposed or be presented or provided for by independent nations or uh, as to buy a hamburger, for example, as you demonstrated? Or will it be international or which is the preference? I'm not sure if I understand exactly how that would work. And perhaps you don't either. No one else probably knows. But could you give some kind of uh, impressions that you may have about governing, public governing with regulations? Well, currently what I've seen is individual countries coming out with their own individual regulations. Um, I would imagine that there are probably regulations being discussed at the, at the United Nations level or, and that kind of thing. Um, uh, but most of the regulations that I've seen as being proposed is, is by the United States or China or individual countries like that. Um, how um, we could ever get to a point where they mesh, given that there are no borders, and that's one of the criticisms of cryptocurrencies is there are no national borders um, uh, like we would have with traditional currency. So. Um, what the solution is to that problem, I have not seen in the literature yet. But uh, right now, the, the current regulations are, at, you know, individual countries' regulations. Just may I ask another question? Of course. Just recently, I read where one of our former students at Indiana University is a Nobel Prize winner. And I understand that from his research, he's determined that it's better to have cash. <laughs> so it's, of course, it's more readily available to an individual who wants to buy something. And you, I, what you're suggesting here is that crypto can do the very same thing <laughs> in some countries, as you described in some of the um, less inclusive uh, nations in the world. Uh, do you, do you, do you, does, does this substitute effectively that kind of concept? that really cash is more available to those who uh, wish to buy uh, with cash or with something readily available? Would, you be, would it be consistent with your own research? I'm not sure that I understand your question. Okay. But readily available. Yeah, well, you mentioned that some countries with cryptocurrency will be able to buy a hamburger. In other words, they can exchange that a private citizen can go into a store and buy a McDonald's hamburger. So, what do they do? Have some kind of agreement? How does that? How does that? Uh, how does that come into effect? Do you have a contract you sign with the with, with with McDonald's to do that? 
Um, the example I gave in El Salvador, the El Salvadorian government, um, uh, first and foremost, said that it's legal. Okay. To, you know, they came out with regulations stating that it's legal um, to make a transaction like that, to use cryptocurrency in place of, of cash, coins, and paper bills. Um, so um, in, in terms of... Um, Making it readily available, it kind of started there with the government being involved. Um, once that was in place, and the McDonald's just uh, began to they they take cash as if they you know in a traditional way coins and paper, but they also uh, have cryptocurrency apps where people can purchase using their, their cryptocurrency coins. Okay. Oh, I see. Um, it's yeah. just instead of the uh, coins and the paper, it's digital mm -hmm. currency. So you can't. I know it's for our generation because I'm I'm up there too. Um, it's hard to wrap your brain around the fact that you cannot see this. <laughs> it just know that it exists. That you uh, you you bought into something that you really can't see. It's like believing in God. There's a God. <laughs> I think you answered that question. God exists. <laughs> You answered my question. But we you can't see God. You answered my question when they, you indicated that they use a computer, that is, they use a, a cell phone to make the exchange. And so that private transaction can take place. I, I, I wasn't just simply aware, thinking of that, but you answered my question. I right. I, you know, I haven't been to the McDonald's in El Salvador, but I would imagine that they have a kiosk. Uh -huh. And you know, not necessarily just a cell phone, but you can right. you can you know some kind of computer transaction. Right now, the other yeah. problem is that I understand that there have been a collapse in this industry somewhere across the across the world. Are you familiar with that? There's a collapse in the industry. Uh, yes, oh right. yeah. Well, it's a crypto crypto winter we're living through, and El Salvador is having second and third thoughts at this point. Okay. And there, I've read, I read a recent book, um, Jacob Goldstein, who's one of the hosts of Planet Money. He did this book on the history of money. And the last chapter is all about cryptocurrency. And I think it'd be a really interesting one for you to look at because he traces the cyber punks, the cipher, cipher punks, sorry, that led to basically Bitcoin and kind of tells some of the backstory about what their, what their reasons were for going down this road. Um, and that might be illuminating um, for kind of how you wind it up. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Oh, this is really <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Go back in the room. <laughs> yeah. Very interesting, especially that you take the energy approach and sustainability. I think that's extremely important for scalability of cryptocurrencies. Um, I think the paper will benefit from a better definition and actually separating the different topics that you are talking about. Because cryptocurrency is a very specific thing, mm -hmm. which you know, has its own regulations, the legal tender, um, it, it is a currency, or at least it tries to assimilate right. a currency. Mm -hmm. What Scott talked about the blockchain technology, the smart contracts is a totally different thing. Mm -hmm. FTX are cryptocurrency exchanges, which can also trade other products. So we are talking about the range of banking and financial products. Mm -hmm. And I think the paper will definitely benefit from separating these areas because they're totally different. You know, when you talk about the unbank, the unbank is online banking is probably some exchanges and some applications. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Other questions? We've probably got time for one more question. Can, can I have a follow-up related sure. to the last one? Yeah. It's, so I, I think one, one traditional thing uh, uh, related to currency is that you you tend to have a legal government monopoly on currency. Uh, and that means would mean very different things. But one thing that it means is that you can always pay with cash. Mm -hmm. You can always cancel a transaction with cash. Okay. So, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you can you cannot have substitutes to that. So I think that's part of the legal, <laughs> all the legal discussions with, with cryptocurrencies have to do with, with that. And then to some extent, government oppositions. Are because this is a challenge to um, you know government monopoly on 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 currency, which again th there might be good good reasons to have a government monopoly on currency. So that's probably very important for the regulation part that you are 
Yeah. Yeah. Out. And then probably the focus is very important there because it's like if you are focusing on something that it's wants to become a substitute of a currency, even in some situations, it's one thing. If you are talking about a financial asset, it's a completely different animal, I think, from the regulation point of view. Thank you. Anyone online? That does bring up some really useful comparative case studies too, Claudia. You know, so you could just do a straight up US UK comparison, for example, of how the proposed federal treasury regulations and whether it's treated as an asset or a currency or kind of depends on the context versus how the UK is going, or even the EU has some new blockchain um, laws as part of their digital single market for next year. Again, you have a whole series here, and it'll wind up as a book, which will be able to do the survey that we want to do. <laughs> Well, we're an article right now. I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> <Low> hanging fruit. <laughs> I see we've run out of questions. Thank you, Zoomites, for being here. Wonderful conversation. <laughs> and people in the room, let's thank Clovia uh, for a wonderful presentation. <laughs>